Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we now move through uh, starting from Palmanach and the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. We are in section number 11 out of the 19 sections. Now, we're going to look at this little poem within the poem, within the larger book of poems, as one example of a thousand that we're going to see of Whitman playing all kinds of interesting rhetorical I'm going to go ahead and call it Echo Games. Now write this in your notes because we're going to see this. We've actually already seen this a number of times in our earlier lectures. And since we're there, let's remind ourselves that the assumption here is that you've been following our work together in, uh, in Leaves of Grass for the previous lectures. Go to LearnStrong.net, find that folder that says Talks with Walt. Our assumption is that you are with us for the 24 uh, poems of inscriptions and as well for the first 10 lectures from starting from Pomenoc that we've already given. Now we're going to look here at this poem as an echo in some ways of maybe the Dixie poem. We're going to ask about Whitman as traveler, okay, and we're going to hear the great biographer Jerome Loving point out that there's no evidence that Whitman was actually ever in Alabama. Now, why is that significant? Uh, well, this is the poem about walking in Alabama. Now, we're going to hear a lot that will be echoes throughout this poem of things to come, all right? And we're also going to hear echoes of the culture at large when Whitman is playing this game. See, we've got to remind ourselves that Whitman's writing these poems for his contemporaries with us in mind, poets to come. With that in mind, there's things he knows his audience knows intuitively that we maybe kind of instinctively can forget. Like, for example, the Song of Dixie, for example, and the, the Hymn of the South as it relates especially to Alabama, Look Away, Look Away, Dixieland. Now, I'm also going to point out how this poem and others like it will be fodder for great writers like T.S. Eliot who will disavow any real affinity to Whitman and yet we're going to hear lines like my words echo thus in your mind but to what purpose disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves I do not know quick said the bird find them find them round the corner now all of a sudden when we hear about echoes and birds and then we come to passage 11 of starting from Pomenoc we know where some of the ideas of Bert Norton will arrive so let's now take a look at, um, at passage 11. We'll just read it and then we'll exegete. As I've walked in Alabama, my morning walk, as I've seen where the she-bird, the mockingbird, sat on her nest in the briars hatching her brood, I've seen the he-bird also. I have paused to hear him near at hand inflating his throat and joyfully singing. And while I paused, it came to me that what he really sang for was not there only, nor for his mate nor himself only, nor all sent back by the echoes, but subtle, clandestine, away beyond, a charge transmitted and gift occult for those being born. Now, there's so much going on in this little poem. This is why we love Walt Whitman so much. You like Emily Dickinson. The most simple lines can provide us like an onion. We just keep peeling back layer upon layer. First of all, let's go ahead and get it out of the way. Whitman will claim throughout Leaves of Grass what a great traveler he has been and continues to be. But of course, it's kind of like Keats saying in the opening of Upon First Looking into Chapman's Homer, much have I traveled in the realms of gold, and of course we know that Keats did very little traveling other than to this Rome where he ultimately died because of his uh, terrible health issues. For Whitman, he only actually has three major trips that will take him away from the New York and surrounding areas. In 1848, he will take his trip, as we've spoken of in, in prior lectures, to New Orleans. And we'll talk in, even here about the potentiality that that 1848 trip is maybe where he went to Alabama, and we just don't know about it. Um, uh, later in 1879, he made a trip out west to Denver, and then uh, a, a year later in 1880, he made a trip north to Canada. And that was it for his traveling abroad. So it's significant that when he says, as I walked in Alabama, it's significant that we, if we have no evidence he was ever in Alabama, then what exactly is going on? And why would he choose Alabama? Why not Georgia? Why not Mississippi? Why not Louisiana? 
where he actually was. Why Alabama? And what's going on with Alabama as being representative of what, right, especially by the end of the deathbed edition as these poems are all being collected, finalized, and published. We know, as we've said, Whitman was editing and producing these lines and, and reproducing these lines through a series of publications of Lisa Grass. As I have walked in Alabama, now let's go ahead and just say it out loud, of course walked is an elided verb, notice the spelling, it's not the ED but the apostrophe, he loves this kind of thing, we saw this in inscriptions. Let's say that Whitman is a great walker. He's a great walker, he's a great love of walking, as was, of course, Wordsworth. And when we get to Song of the Open Road, the greatest poem about walking, we're going to come back to this idea. My morning walk, he loved to walk in the morning, and, and of course, we think immediately of uh, Thoreau and Thoreau's passion for walking as well, especially in the morning. I have seen where the she-bird... The mockingbird, and immediately we have to think of our Harper Lee here, right, to kill a mockingbird, sat on her nest in the briars, and, and let's just point out the fact that briars will come back in leaves of grass over and over again. That, that is to say, the weeds or the thicket, if you will, hatching her brood. And of course, this idea of hatching is of a, a germination kind of motif that we've already seen in earlier poems, even in starting from Pomenon. That is to say, we're going to now say that birds are significant in leaves of grass. We've already said this. The significance of, for example, Shelley's To a Skylark, a text that we've lectured at Lernstrong.net, can't be overstated. But notice here the mockingbird as the bird, and we're going to point out later, out of the cradle, endlessly rocking, will be our return back to this. Again, what I'm trying to suggest is that so much of what starting from Pominock is, is a starting to read leaves of grass. And so all, all the major themes are going to be introduced, as, as we saw in earlier, in, in earlier lectures. We're going to continue to reinvent this idea. And then he says in the second stanza, with uh, notice the anaphoria of I have, I have, I have. I have seen the Hebert also. So we've got two sides of a polarity. In other words, we can think about them as simply gender issues, or we can think about them as representative of two opposites. Can we think about them as the North and the South, and therefore New York versus Alabama? I think so, and I think that's exactly the echoes, to borrow from the actual lines, that Whitman wants to play with. I've seen the Hebert also, and then again the, the alighted verb of pause that will be used twice. I have paused to hear him near at hand. And then this inflating his throat makes us immediately think of Shelley's To a Skylark, of course, right? And joyfully singing. Notice the last line of passage of 10 was cheerfully pass them forward. Here it's joyfully singing. In other words, I have heard both sides of the equation. I've heard the she-bird, mockingbird. I've heard the he-bird joyfully singing. And it gave me pause. It made me consider. It made me reverential. It, that is to say, of the three themes of Leaves of Grass that we saw earlier, that is to say, love, democracy, and religion. Religion is for Whitman this sense of awe, this respect for something quite compelling. Then we have the final stanza. And while I paused, he comes back to the alighted verb again, while I paused, it came to me. Now, this again, this word came or come, it's the first word of leaves of grass in the epitaph, as we've said already, all the way through leaves of grass. This notion of come or coming and how things arrive in some way or how they leave, and that is also a form of coming as well, will be central. But notice as well, this is the epistemological fallibilism of Whitman that's so brilliant. You know, it kind of comes to me. I, I, I don't know where this idea came from, right? We use that language, right, every once in a while. And while I paused, it came to me that what he really sang, that is to say Shelley's To a Skylark Again, for was not there only, nor for his mate, that will be a significant word in Leaves of Grass, circle it, note it, we're going to have comrade, camarero, we're going to have mate, all of these words of companion, nor himself only, nor all sent back by the echoes. And again, we have to think of T.S. Eliot's Burt Norton, the opening lines of Burt Norton when we hear this word echoes. But what was it he was singing for? Notice our words here. These are Whitman-esque words. He is showing his enigmas. He's telling us multiple Whitmans. Look at it. Subtle, that is to say it's not always going to be clear what's going on in Leaves of Grass. 
clandestine, key word in our study and reading of Leaves of Grass. In other words, there will be things that will be buried within ideas and things, and, it, it, and we have to pay attention to that or we're going to miss it, right? And then finally, maybe the, the most interesting one, a way beyond. And it is easy to imagine that readers of Leaves of Grass by 1881 would for sure hear the echoes of Dixie and Alabama when you put all of that together with a way beyond. Look away, look away, right? Beyond. And then finally he says a charge. Now this electricity referencing and symbolism will be huge. We're going to see it all the time through Lisa Grass, so put it in your notes. Transmitted. Now, Whitman never really called himself a transcendentalist, but he loved this prefix trans, and he used it a lot. Here it's transmitted, in other words, from energy, from one energy source to another. And I think in the end, and uh, if, if we need a single tie-in for all of Leaves of Grass, for me it's energy. It is that thing that pulses, that urges, he loves that word. The thing that's procreative, and here it's transmitted. And he also calls it a gift. Now he calls it a cult. That is to say, supernatural, right? And it takes us back to his love of religion and the ways in which he uses that word in such different ways. For those, notice, not born, but those being born. Here we are with our, of our big five ontology. That is to say, who are you? And of course, the answer on one count is, well, you're always being born. You're always being the, the Buddhist idea is, of course, reincarnated. For example, reading a poem like this all of a sudden changes in some ways who you think of as yourself. That is to say, the opposites of your life and the echoes that will haunt you or join you together with all kinds of previous thoughts, they're all there. And I think we have a fascinating idea of how Whitman can play the game of being subtle and clandestine, a way beyond. And we think of Keats's Ode to a Nightingale as well, as the bird is flying away. And of course, the F word of that poem, as we say in another lecture, is fade, fade, as he, of course, flies away. Now, what are we going to do with this at 2A in Themes and Messages? Well, obviously, we can see that the poet and Whitman are, in fact, going to identify with the bird and with the bird songs, but more particularly with those echoes. What we will discover in Leaves of Grass is that Whitman will not say a lot of new things to us. He'll say things to us that are really old, the perennial philosophy, we could argue. And we go, well, I kind of knew that, but I guess I had kind of forgotten that. And now I'm rediscovering that in some profound way, right? And, uh, of course, we should point out another message here is so much can be gained and learned through nature and a love of nature, as we're going to see in so many of the poems of Whitman. At 2B, again, the alighted verbs that are somehow trying to capture the American vernacular and the symbol of the poet as bird is significant. But I also want to play that game of the ways that Whitman will somehow echo from earlier poems to, to poems to come out of the cradle endlessly rocking. We'll come back. We'll have to. We'll come back to this set of lines and we'll say, hey, do you remember what we were saying in passage 11 of starting from Pomona? Now let's take that and let's play another game in out of the cradle endlessly rocking. There's so many references at 3A. Hey, you guys, I'm trying to fight the temptation to point out in every word and every line what we've already read. All of the previous 24 poems from Inscriptions and then, of course, the previous 10 poems from starting from Pomenon. As we get into Leaves of Grass, I'm really going to have to fight this temptation because it's so easy to do this thing where you go, hey, doesn't that remind you of bing, 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 all the way through? Now, as readers of Leaves of Grass, let me exhort you, encourage you, to be playing this game so that all the way through your annotated version of Leaves of Grass, you'll be like, wait, 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 where did I hear this before? I know I heard, I know he said something quite similar. For example, we could ask this and we won't answer it. How many times are there bird references in the 24 poems of inscriptions and the 10 poems of starting from Pomenoc? And how does he play that game? Are they he birds or she birds? Are they defined at all? And do we have any poems where opposites are playing games? And immediately we go, he's playing the game of echoes. In other words, there's all kinds of these echoes that are playing all the way through. And I think T.S. Eliot studied this kind of idea closely in his writing of Four Quartets, so that by the time we get to the end of Four Quartets, and, and of course a little getting, we find ourselves echoing back, in fact, the very final lines of 
of Little Gidding will echo back. We've given full lectures for, uh, for you at LearnStrong.net on all of the four quartets, and I would recommend that at some point sit down and go back and look at those uh, lectures and reread four quartets to hear how much Whitman is being played out there. But just to mention a few ideas here, along with obviously the, the song of Dixie, the Alabama song, right? Um, as we've already mentioned, there's certainly echoes of that. Shelley's To a Skylark, Keats is obviously Nightingale. Think about Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, the Jack the Bird story, as we call it in 303, and go back and look at the ways in which that will leave the young man, that story will leave the young man, what do we say, sadder and wiser? Now, why is that? In his identification with the text. Uh, also, of course, if we're thinking about Jack the Bird in 303, we take a think about Boccaccio's Decameron, especially Federico's Falcon, and the story, of, uh, the story of how birds are symbolic there. Uh, we've mentioned Bert Norton, Song of the Open Road, I want you to put in your notes simply because, and along with Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking, those are the two poems that will come back here again and say, you know, Whitman was setting up so much in Passage 11, in, such a, in just a few short lines, right? Finally, at 3B, as we're trying to then connect in some ways, how about this one? Do you love to walk? Are you a walker? Or has, or has uh, modes of transportation removed your incentive to walk and the joy, therefore, of walking? And if you are a walker, do you enjoy walking in the morning? And how is that different for you from walking in the noon or the evening? Whitman was a great lover of the walk in the morning, as well as what he referenced as a bather. We would just simply call it swimming, okay? Um, how about this one, the Song of Birds? We talked a lot about this when we did Shelley's To a Skylark. To what degree do you love the Song of Birds? And to what degree is the Song of a Bird for you revelatory of all the things that are so profound in your life? As we say in our discussion of Shelley's To a Skylark, the bird sings, but doesn't know about BBs. You do. And the only difference between you and a fly is you know about fly swatters. See, the bird wakes up in the morning. It's not like he goes, oh, geez, I wonder if today's the day I get jacked by the BB. No, 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 no. The bird sings right up into the moment of the BB. Obviously, we can speak either literally or metaphorically. More often here, obviously, metaphorically. That is to say, birds don't know about pain and suffering and death. That will soon be coming, as, of course, do humans. To what degree do you love the song of a bird? And then finally, and you knew this one was probably coming because of our study of T.S. Eliot's Burt Norton especially, what about the echoes of your life? What are they? What are the echoes that keep coming back? It's interesting the number of students who study Leaves of Grass with me that say, it's really weird. It's almost like I'm hearing things that I know I heard long, long ago, but I don't know how or where. Now, this would fit in with the philosophic ideas of Plato's Mino, that learning is about, as we say in other lectures, that recovering of information that you already know. Uh, the only sin is to forget, and we have a tendency to forget. And these echoes allow us to remember, what are the things that keep coming back for you? What are the echoes of your life? Well, let's move on to uh, passage 12 and see what other kinds of insights Walt will share with us. Thank you.